So today's lab is all about measuring the enthalpy of reactions using calorimeters. We ultimately want to measure accurately the amount of heat energy released in a reaction, and a solution calorimeter is the way to do that. The setup is fairly simple. We have an insulated container with a lid, a stirrer to keep everything mixed, and a thermometer to record the temperature inside. Basically, we just need to keep track of the temperature of whatever process is going on inside the calorimeter, and remember that the heat energy released is equal to mc delta t, where m is the mass, c is the heat capacity, and delta t is the amount the temperature changed. Unfortunately, no calorimeters are perfectly adiabatic, meaning that they don't perfectly insulate what's inside. Therefore, the calorimeter itself will actually absorb some heat energy, and so this has to be taken into account. For this reason, the first step today is to calibrate our calorimeter to measure the amount of energy we might expect it to absorb. To calibrate our calorimeter, we're basically just going to pour hot water and cold water together in the calorimeter and see what temperature they end up at. We know that the heat change for the hot water is mc delta t, and the heat change for the cold water is also mc delta t. Since the hot water cools down, delta t will be negative, and so will q. Likewise, delta T, and therefore Q, for the cold water will be positive since it gains energy. And you might think that the two will cancel out. This makes sense since the heat energy that the hot water lost would have gone to the cold water, right? Well, it turns out that they don't quite cancel because the calorimeter that the mixture is sitting in also absorbs some energy. So we need to take that into account. The mass of the calorimeter never changes. So we often combine M and C as just uppercase C, known as the calorimeter constant. Also, since in our calibration we're using the calorimeter that the hot water was in, that is, we pour the cold water into the hot, the delta T for the calorimeter is the same as the delta T for the hot water. And so finally, we know everything we need to calculate C, which quantifies the amount of heat energy that this particular calorimeter absorbs. We know the masses of the hot and cold water samples. We know the specific heat capacity for liquid water. We measure the temperature change of the hot and cold water. And we know that they all have to add up to zero, since energy cannot be created or destroyed. We now just solve for the calorimeter constant, and we're done. The reaction we're going to look at today is called a neutralization reaction, because we're adding equal amounts of acid, HCl, and base, NaOH, thereby neutralizing the pH. This turns out to be quite exothermic, so there will be plenty of heat change to record. We're going to carry out this reaction in water, inside a solution calorimeter, so we'll have the reaction, the solution it's dissolved in, and the calorimeter all exchanging heat energy. The heat of neutralization is actually what we're looking for in this experiment. The heat change of the solution is equal to the mass of the solution times the heat capacity of the solution, which is given in your lab manual, times the temperature change that you record. The heat change of the calorimeter is just the calorimeter constant that you measured in step one times the temperature change of the solution. Since we weigh the solution and measure the temperature change during the reaction, we have everything we need to know to accurately determine the heat of neutralization. Don't forget, at constant pressure, which the lab is under, the heat of neutralization is actually equal to the enthalpy of neutralization. Two thermometers are provided for today's experiment, but they must first be calibrated against one another. What this means is that they'll give slightly different temperatures, even in the same solution. So what you need to do is pick one, and it doesn't matter which, and assume it to be correct. Then put both thermometers in the same beaker of room temperature water, record the readings of both of the thermometers, and calculate the correction that must be applied to the second thermometer to yield a value that's consistent with the value of the first thermometer you chose. This small number of degrees, whatever it is, will need to be applied as a correction to your reading from the second thermometer all day. So don't forget, tear a 250 ml beaker on the rough balance and add about 100 grams of cold tap water. Record the mass of the water to the nearest 0 0.01 gram, then set it aside and record its temperature. Next, tear your calorimeter on the rough balance and add about 100 grams, to the nearest 0.01 gram, of hot water, which is available in the fume hood. Immediately put on the calorimeter lid and use the other thermometer to measure its temperature, which should be about 50 degrees when you begin. For a 5 minute period, measure and record the temperatures of both the warm and the cold water samples simultaneously, every 30 seconds. 
At exactly five minutes, pour the cold water into the calorimeter while stirring the hot water. Ensure that all the cold water is added to the calorimeter and record the time of mixing. At five and a half minutes, and then every 30 seconds for another four minutes, continue to measure and record the temperature of the mixed sample. You'll need to calculate your calorimeter constant before proceeding to part two, so you'll need to get out your graph paper. Make a graph where the temperature you recorded is plotted on the y-axis, which is the longer edge of the paper, and the time, in minutes, on the x-axis. Don't forget to apply the correction to all the temperatures measured with the incorrect thermometer, like I mentioned before. On your graph, extend your temperature profiles to the time of mixing. If you need any help making a proper graph, you can check out Appendix E in your lab manual. In the second part, you'll basically do the same thing as in the first. Place 100 grams of the 1.5 molar HCl in your calorimeter and record the mass to the nearest 0.01 gram. In a separate beaker, place 100 grams of the 1.5 molar NaOH solution, also record the mass to the nearest 0.01 grams. Precisely measure the temperature of each solution using your two thermometers. For a five minute period, measure and record the temperature of both solutions every 30 seconds. At exactly five minutes, pour the entire sodium hydroxide solution into the acid solution and mix them well. Record the time of mixing and continue to measure and record the temperature for a further four minute period at 30 second intervals. Don't forget to stir regularly. Plot your temperature data for part two in the same manner as you did for part one. Show the temperature of each solution prior to mixing and of the solution after mixing. Again, evaluate the change in temperature arising from mixing, which is delta T of neutralization, and use this value in your calculations. To calculate the heat of neutralization for the acid-base reaction, the first thing we need is our calorimeter constant from our calibration step. From your plot in part one, you can find the change in temperature of both your hot and cold samples. Now we can use the equation we derived earlier. You've recorded the masses and temperature changes for each of the hot and cold samples, and you know that the specific heat capacity for water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So you just need to solve for the calorimeter constant and you're done. Using that calorimeter constant, we can now turn our attention to calculating the enthalpy of our acid-base reaction. If you'll recall, we had derived this equation. You've already weighed your acid and base, so the total mass of the solution is just the mass of the two added together. The specific heat capacity of your solution is given, and the temperature change of the solution was measured. You can read it off the plot you generated. So using your calorimeter constant gives you everything you need to calculate your heat of neutralization. The only thing left to do is express your answer in terms of kilojoules per mole. We already know the joules part, since we just calculated that, but don't forget to convert joules to kilojoules. But how many moles was it that reacted? Well, we know the mass of each of our HCl and NaOH solutions, since we weighed them. So for each, we can use the density, which is given in the lab manual, to calculate the exact volumes of each. Then we can use the exact concentrations of each, in moles per liter, to figure out how many moles of each we had. Though we tried to use the exact same amount of HCl and NaOH, Inevitably, one of them will be slightly less than the other, and that's what we call the limiting reagent. That represents the maximum number of moles that would have reacted, and that's the number that is used to convert our final answer to kilojoules per mole.